respect is an important part of the practice. And it centers on respect for our own desire for true happiness. This is why every evening before we meditate we have to chant, May I be happy. And it's not simply a desire for ordinary happiness, it's a desire for true happiness, the kind that comes from within, the kind that doesn't take anything away from anyone else. This is a desire that's worthy of respect. The reason we respect the Buddha is because he teaches us to honor this desire, to honor this aspiration, and also to respect the qualities of our minds that can bring that happiness into being, that can make it a truth within us, within us, something that's really there and not just an aspiration. So it comes down to respect for three things. One is respect for our own ability to attain that happiness. Two is respect for the basic principles of cause and effect that can lead us there. It's not simply by wishing or wanting that we can get there. We have to develop skillful qualities in the mind, like we're doing right now, training the mind in mindfulness, training the mind in alertness. Keep the breath in mind, that's mindfulness and be alert to what the breath is doing. Know when it's coming in, know when it's going out. Know when it's comfortable, know when it's not comfortable. If it's not comfortable, you can change. You're not condemned to having to put up with whatever breath happens to present itself. If you find the breathing feels a little too short, well, you can make it longer. If it's too long, you can make it a little shorter. You can adjust the texture, you can adjust the rhythm. You can adjust your conception of what it means to breathe. When the breath energy comes flowing in the body, where does it come from? You can think of the breath coming in and out every pore. What does that do to the way the breathing feels? What does that do to the way that the body feels as a whole? There's a lot to experiment with. And it's through experimentation that we learn about the principle of cause and effect. Meditation is not simply a process of doing as you're told. It's learning about cause and effect in your mind by experimenting, by playing around, focusing in different spots to see what difference that makes, adjusting the sensation of the breathing, adjusting your conception of the breathing to see what difference that makes. So you get a sense of what causes what in the mind, what causes what in the body, how the body and the mind affect each other. As you develop skill with this principle, that enables you to be more and more adept at using the causal principles in body and mind to take you to ever more refined levels of well-being, more refined levels of peace. It's known as having respect for cause and effect, respect for the way things are. And finally, there's respect for people who've been on the path. people who have mastered those principles and have advice they can give you. This is why we read Dharma books, listen to Dharma tapes, why we have questions and answers with other people who have practiced, so we can benefit from their experience as well. Because the respect has to cover all three areas, our own abilities, respect for just the way things are. There are certain things that no matter how much you wish them just can't happen. You've got to respect the principle of cause and effect, and then respect for the people who have also experimented with that principle and gained results. When you can combine all these things, that's the proper use of respect. In other words, you don't simply listen to what other people say without listening to your own heart. On the other hand, you don't listen to your own heart without listening to what other people say. Both of these things have to be tested against what actually works. It's like learning any skill. You respect your own ability to do it. If you don't have confidence in your own ability, it's, it's hard to tackle it. Run into a few difficulties and you give up. So you've got to have respect for yourself.
in particular respect for your good qualities. One of the good things about the, the Buddha's teachings is he says the path is good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end. In other words, it's not just good in the end. But in the process of trying to define true happiness, we develop qualities within the mind of which we can be proud. Which is very different from the way of the world. Out there they say, you know, get what you can, do whatever you need to do in order to get get ahead of other people. In the course of which you develop a lot of personal qualities that you don't really feel good about. But here you're developing kindness, compassion, mindfulness, discernment, alertness, persistence, reliability. All good qualities, qualities that feel good in and of themselves and are conducive to true happiness. So it's not only a good goal, but it's a good path. And you develop more and greater sense of self-esteem, self-worth as you follow the path. So that's the beginning of a, any skill, is self-respect. Secondly is respect for the principles of the skill in and of itself, the principles of cause and effect, because there are certain things you cannot change. No matter how much you would like things to be different, you respect the way things are. If it's going to take a long time, okay, you're willing to give it a long time. If it takes a lot of effort, you're willing to give the effort, whatever effort is required. When the Buddha talks about right effort, it's not just kind of a halfway effort or a mediocre effort. It's an effort appropriate to whatever is needed. Sometimes it's a very gentle effort. Sometimes it requires a lot more willpower and strength. But you have respect for whatever is required, and you do your best to fulfill the requirements. Because when the Buddha pointed out the path, it's not that he made up the path. He just pointed out what he had found and experienced, and this was the way things were. So it's not simply a matter of opinion, it's a matter of experience. Something that's been tried and tested. And we have to try and test ourselves against those principles, too, if we want to gain the results that we, that we want. And this is combined with respect for the wise. We look for people who seem to have gained results in the path who have the qualities that we would like to develop within ourselves, and we listen to them, we pay them respect. John Fuhr had a nice story about paying respect. He's talking about one time when he was living with a John Lee. They'd build an ordination hall. And typically in Thailand, when you build an ordination hall, you have the Buddha image in the west side of the hall facing east. Because that's supposed to be the position the Buddha was, the direction the Buddha was facing on the, the night of his awakening. And so they decided that under the Buddha image they would place kind of their equivalent of what we would call a cornerstone, a large box planted down in the ground, filled with all kinds of auspicious things, texts and relics and amulets and Buddha images, precious items, all sealed up. And then as they were building the, the hall, about sort of halfway through the construction, a John Lee changed his mind. He wanted to have the Buddha image in the east side of the hall facing west. He had a message. The Buddhism was going to go west. But when the hall was finished and everything was done, they suddenly realized that the, the box was under the west side of the hall, the Buddha image was on the east side of the hall, which meant that people walking in and out the west side of the hall would be stepping right over the box. And the Thais have a very strong sense of above and below. You now it's not appropriate to step over things that are considered sacred. So when someone pointed this out to a John Lee, he turned to a John Fu and he said, okay, get the monks down there and move it. So John Fu knew there was no way he could move that box. It was planted firmly in the ground. But he also knew if he said that to a John Lee right at that point, a John Lee said, well, if you don't feel you can do it, I'll find someone else who does have a conviction. So John Fuhr didn't say anything. The next day he got all the able-bodied monks and novices in the monastery down under the ordination hall, which was just a lot of mud. It was kind of like a crawl space. He wrapped ropes around the box and tried to pull it. Tried all day long, couldn't budge an inch. So that evening he went to see a John Lee and 
said, how about if we make a new box under the Buddha image, open up the old box, take all the auspicious things out of that and put it in the new box and seal it up. And John Lee just sort of nodded slightly. When John Fuhn told me the story, he said, that's how you show respect. In other words, it's not that the teacher is always going to be right, but you give the teacher the benefit of the doubt. If things don't work out, then you go back and say, okay, I've tried this, this, and this. Things didn't work out. Is there another approach? So it's a question of balancing all three things. Your respect for yourself, your respect for people with experience on the path, and your respect for simply what works in terms of cause and effect, what works in when you put it in what, what works when you put it into practice. And the skill lies in balancing those three. Because there are times when the the teachings say one thing, your experience it says something else. And you've got to check, okay, who's more reliable here? Because after all, the, the books can be mistaken. There can be mistakes in translation, mistakes in transmission. But you can also be mistaken too. This is why the Buddha once said, Bring me someone who is honest and no deceiver, and I'll teach that person the Dharma. It comes down to your own honesty. Your own honesty about what you do, your own honesty about your intentions, your own honesty about the results you really get. This is the quality you really have to depend on, because it's what makes all the difference in the practice. If you're very clear about what you're doing in the practice, and what the results are, what gets connected with what, in other words, what cause is connected to what effect. It's a lot easier to make pr practice and make progress in the practice. It's a lot easier to judge what's skillful and what's unskillful. It's interesting that in the like of the Jataka tales, stories that are collected and said to be stories about the Buddha in his previous lifetimes. There are times when the Buddha doesn't act in all, those honor, in that, all that honorable a way. Times when he actually breaks some of the five precepts. This is in his previous lifetimes. But the interesting thing is there's one precept that's never broken, and that's the precept against lying. In these stories, the Buddha never lies, no matter what the situation is. So truthfulness is an essential quality all across the board. This is the basic quality. Once you have truthfulness, then the other qualities follow. As John Lee once said, if you want to find the truth, you have to be true. This is what it means. Honest with yourself. Once you've made up your mind to do something, you stick with it. You're no traitor to yourself. If you find places where the mind is not all that open and above board with itself, well, you try to open up the, the walls that the mind has erected there. So you can be really clear and straightforward about what you're doing, what's working, what's not working. With this kind of openness, this kind of respect, this kind of truthfulness, that's how progress happens. So when we have that chant about having respect for the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha, what it comes down to is respect for the good qualities they developed. So you can use them as examples to develop those same good qualities within yourself. The qualities are there. We all have skillful qualities. Simply difference in the extent to which we've developed them, the extent to which we put them to use. The meditation we're doing right now, that's a skill. You use the same principles in developing as you would in any skill. Encourage yourself in doing it. Stick with it. Pay careful attention to what you're doing. When things don't work out, use your ingenuity to find other approaches. These are the basic principles that work in any skill, and they apply here. Notice when desire is helpful in the practice. Notice when desire is not helpful, when it gets in the way. Learn how to make use of desire so that it is an, an assistance in your meditation. In other words, focus your desires on the causes. 
the causes here, being mindful of the breath, being alert to the breath, and being ardent in keeping that mindfulness going, keeping that alertness sharp. Once you've got the causes down, then the results will have to come. All too often we focus our desires on the results. We'd like it to be this way, like it to be that way, and we get frustrated when it doesn't happen. Well, if you're focusing on the, co on the results, then what happened to the causes? They've been abandoned. So turn around and focus on the causes. Once you've got those mastered, every, everything you want out of the practice will have to come. So again, it's having respect for the principle of cause and effect, respect for your ability to learn how to master that principle. We sometimes hear that the Buddha said, you know, follow your own sense of right and wrong. Well, if you look at the passage that they quote, that's not what he really said. He said, look what, at what works in practice. When you see for yourself that certain ways of behavior give good results, okay, follow those ways. If you see that they don't, learn to abandon them. In other words, you have to be really alert to cause and effect. And he also says, take into account what the wise say as well. Of course, this means you have to figure out who's wise and who's not wise. But take into consideration the lessons that have been learned by other people on the path, because the principle of cause and effect is the same for them as it is for you. And it helps a lot so that you don't have to keep reinventing the Dharma wheel. But when you learn how to balance these different forms of respect, okay, that's when the that's when the meditation grows, when your own good qualities grow your own skillful qualities grow, and you get a better and better sense of what's skillful and what's unskillful in your own mind. John Fuhrer once said that respect is a sign of intelligence, and this was the kind of respect he was talking about. 